Hello students, welcome to lecture 34 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's lecture will be discussing unusual refraction and diffraction effects. So here is the lecture outline. So first we will have a brief introduction, discuss about reflection and diffraction. Then we will go into this effect of refraction and then the ISO frequency diagrams. We will also discuss about unusual refraction and diffraction effects. And finally, we will look into some of the emerging trends and applications of the photonic crystal technology. So, while, while this course primarily focusing, focuses on confining light within uh, photonic structures, it is important also to know and explore the dynamics of light as it freely propagates in and around the photonic crystals. So, in this lecture, we will briefly uh, review various interesting phenomena which are associated with the free propagation of waves through photonic crystal. And uh, we will relate those phenomena to the fundamental principles which were discussed in the previous lectures, enhancing the understanding of both confined and free propagation wave behavior in this photonic environment. So, let us focus on this slide and you can see the figure, okay. This is basically uh, a photonic crystal, right. So, let us consider the case of an incident plane wave, okay. So, this is the incident plane wave and it strikes the interface of a photonic crystal, okay. So, this is a photonic crystal. Now, there is something interesting as you can see, okay. So, this is the photonic crystal so it is basically a square lattice right but this plane where uh, the light is basically incidenting on that is a diagonal plane right so th this is a 110 direction okay that's in that that's the interface so if you look into this what you are seeing you are basically seeing the schematic of reflection which is shown in blue and then you have refraction that is shown in red, okay, of the plane wave which is incident at this interface, okay. So, that is shown in black and this is basically a square lattice of dielectric rods in air, okay. And uh, the lattice period you can see here that is A and the interface is this one, the diagonal one that has got a periodicity of capital lambda. And the relation between capital lambda and A is capital lambda equals A root 2, okay, because that is in the diagonal direction, right. So, what are the other things? This dashed arrows, they basically show diffracted reflections, which can go higher order reflection in different direction. Similarly, you can also have some additional refracted waves, okay. On the right, what do you see? You actually see the ISO frequency contour in K space. So, if you remember what are those, if you think of a 3D uh, band diagram and then if you take slices along the frequency axis, okay, those, those cross sections of the band diagram with that plane will give you ISO frequency contour. So, uh, these contours, they represent the same frequency and here it is, uh, th these ones are basically drawn for omega a by 2 pi c equals 0 0.276 that is the control that you are seeing. So, you are basically having uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 uh, almost like circles that is how the contours look like here, okay. So, we will go into this description a uh, little later because this is where we will be representing um, air also. So, this is air, okay, a, a circle which is shown in black. And then for the crystal, you have this uh, red contours, okay. And uh, this is the Brillouin zone. So it starts from minus 0 0.5 to 0.5. Here also minus 0 0.5 to 0.5, okay. So, so this is the Brillouin zone, which is shown in gray. And then these points basically are the K points, and the group velocity direction are shown for different k points. So, this is the direction of incident wave. So, this is the direction of incident wave. You can see the reflected wave is here and this is the refracted wave. We will come into this, this discussion a uh, little late, okay. Let us first try to understand what is happening, 
okay so the first thing very simple the incident light can be reflected from the interface at the same angle as the incident angle so we all know this okay now outside the photonic band gap okay what may happen that there is possibility of light transmission so if it is if the frequency of the light falls within the band gap there will be no transmission or refraction at all like everything will get reflected so if we are considering the frequency outside the photonic band gap light may be transmitted or refracted within the crystals at some angles which are determined by the group velocity so this is where this particular diagram will come handy will come there now depending on frequency interface periodicity and the band structure the Bragg diffraction may occur and that may produce this additional uh, reflected and or this kind of refracted waves okay so let us apply block theorem here so block theorem will help explaining the wave propagation in crystals with discrete translational symmetry and this is what this crystal has got right so only the wave vector component k parallel which is basically the parallel to this interface will be conserved due to the translational symmetry along the interface okay so the conserved wave vector parallel to the interface will imply that k parallel changes by multiples of 2 pi by capital lambda right and where lambda capital lambda is basically the periodicity that is parallel to this interface so that plays an important role not a but then lambda and a are related because lambda equals root to a now let us look into the wave vector and the frequency conservation so any reflected or refracted wave at the interface must retain the same frequency omega as that of the incident wave right so the wave vector of these waves is modified by this factor so the parallel one can have this form k parallel plus 2 pi l by lambda where l can be an integer and then you have also the normal component which is k normal or k perpendicular okay so with k perpendicular possibly varying right so all these possibilities are there now let us look into this diagram which is the isofrequency diagram now why you need this this is useful for analyzing how the refracted wave propagate within the crystal based on their frequency and the direction okay so the interface has got a periodicity capital lambda that we understood and that is different from the lattice periodicity which is a okay and this is the reason why because the interface is basically a diagonal interface and the plane is 110 so analysis primarily will focus on periodic interfaces to simplify the predictions of wave behavior right so now let's go into reflection and diffraction and try to figure out what is happening here so the first thing is specular reflection or the normal reflection okay so here you can see you get this bold blue line that shows the specular reflection which is basically the reflected wave corresponding to l equals zero okay and that represents the plane wave with k vector which has got k parallel comma k perpendicular prime so k parallel remains same but then <coughs> the conservation of uh, frequency and wave vector component will imply that the normal component is basically negative of the incident one so you get k normal perpendicular will be minus of k normal okay so they, that basically adheres to the law of equal incident and reflected angles okay as you can also see here so if the incident angle is theta reflected angle will be minus theta right so with that you can establish the relationship of uh, refractive index and the wave factors okay so given the incident medium has got a refractive index say n i you can write the relationship that n i square omega square by c square will be equal to k parallel square plus k perpendicular square okay so if you write for reflected that will be same k parallel square plus you know you have k perpendicular prime square uh, that will also hold true so as a result what we can get we can see that k perpendicular prime 
or k normal prime can be plus minus of k normal and the negative sign is basically selected to uh, ensure that the wave basically propagates away from the interface right so then you have uh, this uh, diffracted <laughs> diffractive reflections and uh, frequency uh, conditions and that will happen when l is not zero okay so you have those higher order terms so l is integer so you can put one two three and so on okay so the diffractive relations for non-zero l will depend on frequency where you can derive this k normal prime from this particular equation so k normal prime will be minus square root of n i square omega square by c square minus k parallel plus 2 pi by 2 pi l by lambda whole square okay now looking at this uh, equation if omega is uh, too small or your l is too large in that case this uh, quantity becomes imaginary so that indicates an evanescent field and that will decay exponentially from the interface so what are the, now for the reflection case what are the conditions for non evanescent diffractive reflections okay so you want higher order reflections but then they should not be evanescent okay so the non evanescent reflections will occur only if you have this particular condition satisfied where omega should be larger than c modulus of the parallel component of wave vector plus 2 pi by 2 pi l by capital lambda divided by n i okay so for an incident angle of theta which is greater than or equal to 0 the critical condition for the first diffractive reflection that is l equals minus 1 will be this so you can put here l equals minus 1 you can simplify and find out what is that condition so you know that with this condition where capital lambda by small lambda will be larger than 1 over n i times 1 plus sin theta you can actually have uh, this okay and this is the parallel component of the wave vector so this is the condition for getting the first diffractive reflection corresponding to l equals minus 1 now let's consider some practical implications for air so if you take n i equals 1 so you can find out that the diffractive reflections are absent if this is the condition that if your omega capital lambda by 2 pi c or you say capital lambda lambda by small lambda is less than equals uh, to 0 0.5 okay in that case uh, the diffractive re reflections will be absent okay so that is basically covering the frequencies near most band gap if uh, lambda capital lambda is taken as a also so when diffractive reflections occur each diffracted order that is l starts at glancing angles which are basically parallel to the interface that means you can take uh, k normal prime so k perpendicular prime or dash to be equal to zero and then it moves towards the specular reflection angle which is minus theta as omega increases okay so as i mentioned the specular reflection angle is basically the angle of reflection where it equals to the incidence angle but on the opposite side of the normal that means for minus theta so now let's that 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 is what we understood for reflection so now let's look into refraction and the isofrequency diagrams okay so first thing we have to investigate the propagating waves in the crystal with a modified surface parallel wave vector so instead of k parallel now you have k parallel plus 2 pi l by capital lambda okay and then we have to ensure that the group velocity points away from the interface okay so the set of available states that is if you find omega as a function of k okay so that is basically dictated by the band structure of the crystal okay so there will be nothing within the band gap so that is why it is crystal dependent so if you change the crystal you can actually change the band gap and those are the frequencies for which you will never get a refracted wave right so you got to have the idea of how the band gap looks like for a typical photonic crystal that you are dealing with now you have you how do you utilize the band diagrams and the isofrequency diagrams so traditional band diagrams they are usually limited 
to showing states around the brilliant zone boundaries uh, but they are not sufficient for detailed analysis here so here we have to employ contour plots of omega as a function of kx and ky in the kx ky plane so these are basically known as isofrequency or wave vector diagrams to predict uh, curves of constant omega okay so if you consider the uh, frequency here which is uh, normalized frequency 0 0.276 that represents the value of omega a by 2 pi c so this contour from the incident medium so here the incident medium is air okay that is depicted as a circle okay so this is basically that uh, omega equals ck relationship okay and the transmitted medium is basically the photonic crystal right so here in this diagram both are superimposed so how do you analyze this so you have to first determine the incident angle and the wave vector so the incident angle is represented by a specific wave vector k okay that is uh, marked as a black dot as you can see here and its associated group velocity is indicated by a black arrow on the incident contour okay so this is how the incident angle is marked now how do you select uh, modes with conserved k parallel so first thing is that you have to draw a dashed line as you see here they have drawn this dashed line which is basically the k parallel line okay so which is the parallel wave vector okay so that goes through this incident wave vector k and it is also perpendicular to the interface so that if you remember the interface is this way okay so the interface goes this way so this line is basically perpendicular to that interface okay and wherever it intersects okay so this is where it intersects this particular line and this determines possible uh, refracted wave paths as well so this is air and this is where it intersects with the crystal contour so this this was the way you can determine the refracted wave direction okay so what is interesting here to note that how do you identify the valid refracted waves so not all intersections of this k parallel line with the photonic crystal contours okay so you can see there is an intersection here also okay but will that produce a viable refracted wave okay that we have to see so the intersections where the group velocity points towards the interface okay will be discarded so this is the interface okay so if the group velocity points towards the interface that is discarded so you have to see that the group velocity has to move away from the interface this is the interface so you have to move away from the interface right next how to handle the equivalent points in periodic k space so intersections differing by a reciprocal lattice factor that is uh, equivalent points in the periodic k space will basically represent the same eigenstate so redundant points are not considered as distinct okay so in this depicted scenario what you can see that only one refracted wave is valid that is basically this red dot and the arrow okay and it is interestingly on the same side of the incident wave okay that means this is not typically the snell's law of refraction if it is a snell's law it would have gone this side okay of the normal but it is basically on this side and that is only possible so this particular crystal basically gives you kind of negative refractive index okay so another important point that you can see that you can eliminate any intersections which are basically marked as the pink points okay here are the pink dots okay they are basically correspond to a group velocity that is this pink arrow okay towards the interface of the crystal okay as this would basically violate the condition that you know uh, boundary condition because the only incoming uh, power is basically coming from the incident medium right so only this can go like this so in the figure we happen to only have a single refracted wave that is basically this red dot and arrow okay 
which in this case lies on the same side as we have seen that it is basically uh, opposite to that of the Snell's law. Now multiple refracted wave can occur if the fixed k parallel line basically intersects multiple bands in the band structure right. So that will necessitate the superposition of several contours on this isofrequency diagram. So how about single band operation and intersection condition? So the example provided here operates below the band gap where only one band is present and thus uh, typically that limits the occurrence of multiple refracted waves. So what are the geometrical and angular consideration? Now if the interface is tilted differently, okay, in that case this uh, fixed k parallel line would have also been different because this line is basically perpendicular to the interface. So that would have intersect the same contour at multiple points like here, okay, here also it is there, you see the pink dot is there, okay, but then if you move it like this, it would have done in other place as well, okay. And if there are, in this case, these are equivalent points, but then you could have got non-equivalent or inequivalent points also in different periodic unit cells, okay, and that would have definitely led to multiple refracted waves. Now, at the frequencies below certain cutoff, typically only one refracted wave is possible, and that aligns more with the traditional uh, Snell's law, as the wavelength will become large so that you know when lambda becomes very large okay uh, in that particular limit um, the behavior will basically mimic the Snell's law that will suggest that the medium will start acting like a effective medium with some average refractive index. So in that case that large wavelength will not see the periodic crystal it will rather see a homogeneous equivalent medium effective medium something. So that is the approach to ordinary Snell's law in large wavelength limit. Now if you consider small frequency which are much smaller than pi c by a, in that case you will see that the iso uh, frequency diagram they will feature nearly circular contours okay and when you have circular contours, they basically are indicative of constant group velocity. Now, certain conditions may also lead to no refracted waves similar to the phenomena of total internal reflection which are basically observed in traditional optics. So that is also possible and how the photonic band gaps are influencing this. So photonic band gaps will provide additional scenarios where reflection can occur even if the condition is typically not favoring the total internal reflection. That is where you know this is something extra in the photonic crystal case. So though the incident angle is not satisfying but if it is you know if the frequency is uh, falling within the band gap in that case it will get totally reflected. The geometric impacts on uh, refraction and reflection. So larger incident angle may prevent the intersection of the k parallel line with the photonic crystal contours okay so you can see if, if it goes like this okay it will not uh, reflect it will not actually intersect these contours in that case there is no refracted wave at all that means there is total reflection right so that could happen even for frequencies which are outside the photonic band gap at uh, some other angle okay so all these possibilities are there now let us look into some unusual refraction and diffraction effects. So the first one is having sharp corners in the isofrequency contours that you can see here. Okay. So the sharp, con sharp corners in the isofrequency contours such as those around the M points okay, uh, in the first band would allow for a dramatic change in the direction of the group velocity as the incident angle or the frequency is slightly altered. So this will basically lead to rapid transition from one side of the contour to the other okay and you can also that see the super prism effect. So this is basically nothing but the significant change in the refractive angle uh, 
for minimal adjustment in the incident angle or frequency right so it is like you know what a prism does but here uh, with very little change in the incident angle there will be a significant change in the uh, refractive ang angle and that can give rise to super prism effect so as i mentioned this is similar but to the traditional prism uh, which disperses different wavelengths into various angles but with a much uh, narrower wavelength range that affects a broader angle spectrum. So here you can see this is for band 1 and band 2. So these are the contour plots that means these are basically frequency as a function of kx ky. For the first two tm bands of a square lattice uh, of radius 0.2a. So these are basically dielectric rods the, where the permittivity is 11.4 and they are kept in air. Now this super prism effect basically opens up some potential applications in frequency demultiplexing and some other areas where uh, precise control over the direction of light becomes very crucial. So similarly if you have a flat um, contours in the band diagram okay that would uh, facilitate large changes in the phase velocity and that can further enhance the control over the light propagation we'll look into these effects here so first one we can discuss about the flatness of isofrequency contours okay so some contours in the photonic crystal isofrequency diagram as you can see here okay are nearly flat they are almost like square so you can see like this okay so you can also see here right this part so this this part is shown here okay so when the uh, light comes out of this one so the velocity direction is almost they are normal to this particular uh, contour so you will see that almost uh, parallel uh, waves are coming out okay so that is how you can uh, make collimated beams using uh, photonic crystals so in a homogeneous medium different kx component of the finite width beam that is traveling in the x direction can spread out okay like this is in the case of normal uh, medium so the finite um, width beam will basically spread out as you can see and that is basically due to the classical uh, diffraction. Uh, so if you consider the angle that different propagation angle theta can be calculated as sine inverse of c k y by n omega okay as you see in this case okay. But if you have the flat condors around the gamma point as you can see here in band 2 okay so here you can see that these are basically almost square or flat kind of contours okay this will ensure that the group velocities for various kx values are basically aligned in the x direction and that basically minimizes the beam spreading okay so this is what is shown as red arrows in figure 3 so as i mentioned these are also known as super collimation effect so here a beam whose Fourier components align with such a flat contour that will exhibit super collimation that means they will that beam will spread out very slowly okay and i have already indicated this earlier that you can actually see negative refraction in photonic crystals and this is what is happening okay so ideally the refracted beam should have gone this side but here you are getting this way okay so this negative refraction occurs uh, when the refracted beam is basically appearing on the same side of the normal so this is the normal so it is appearing on the same side of the normal as the incident beam and this phenomena is basically achievable across all incident angles in specific frequency range by carefully designing the photonic crystal so this is something very unique and interesting and if you compare with the uh, homogeneous materials okay the negative uh, refraction in homogeneous materials was first uh, studied by Vesselago in 1968 which I believe I have mentioned in the initial lectures 
okay and that occurs when both electric permi permittivity epsilon and the magnetic permeability mu are negative so this enables you know unique features something like near field Im imaging through flat lenses and all these things so regarding development of artificial negative index materials so although you know natural materials with uh, negative index does not exist uh, professor pendry sir john pendry and uh, smith uh, in 2000 they were able to construct such materials uh, at microwave frequencies using some tiny metallic resonators which uh, approximates a homogeneous medium at at wavelengths much larger than the periodicity right so next important thing would be like to find out all dielectric negative refraction and the engineering challenges therein so unlike the homogeneous models if you think of all dielectric negative refraction that is basically shown here isn't it because this entire structure is made of dielectric material but here you had those metal involved right they, they were giving you that negative permittivity okay so here um, they are basically using uh, wavelengths which are comparable to the um, periodicity and uh, it requires more complex description beyond a single effective index okay so emulating the behaviors like sub wavelength imaging imaging um, demands precise engineering of the surface states and the refracted waves with some practical limitations such as finite size and the material absorption that could pose some ongoing challenges to this area but a lot of people are working on this because this this requires a lot of attention to make a viable solution in this particular imaging applications so let us now quickly briefly look at some other emerging uh, trends and applications in the photonic crystal technology okay so we can see that uh, there are nonlinear optics then you have topological photonic crystals you have applications in biology then you have metamaterials nanophotonics and so on so nonlinear optics how how photonic crystals are used so photonic crystals are used to manipulate nonlinear optical processes such as second harmonic generation, four wave mixing, okay, enabling applications such as optical parametric amplifiers and frequency converters. Okay. Topological photonic crystals, they, they basically exhibit uh, protected light propagation along the edges or surfaces with the topological uh, states, making them robust against uh, defects and imperfections so there are a lot of work going on in the 6g technology using topological photonic insulators to prepare uh, devices which are robust and eligible for this high frequency operations so they have hold promise for low loss waveguides and on chip optical circuits for biology you know uh, photonic crystals can serve as carriers in drug delivery systems which are designed to release drugs in response to some specific stimuli something like ph or temperature change and that will actually enhance the drug delivery accuracy and that will reduce the side effects so researchers are also working towards uh, using photonic crystal for improving photosynthesis efficiency in plants um, so that you know they can channel light more effectively into the plant cells potentially increasing the food production with lower energy requirements the other areas as i mentioned like metamaterials and metasurfaces where the combination of photonic crystals with these structures will enable the control of light in unconventional ways leading to the applications such as cloaking devices perfect absorbers and polarization controllers and so on in nanophotonics, researchers have been exploring the integration of photonic crystals with nanoscale devices and materials. And this has led to development of novel functionalities, something like nano lasers, nano cavities, nanoscale sensors, and so on. So these advantage, advancements open up possibilities for miniaturized and highly efficient photonic devices of the future. Other areas would be like integrated photonics where photonic crystals can be integrated into on-chip photonic circuits to enhance light manipulation and integration 
and by combining different functionalities such as waveguides, filters, modulators within a single photonic crystal uh, structure, researchers are basically developing compact and efficient devices for optical communication, sensing and computing applications. Other applications include smart materials, okay. So, smart materials in photonic crystals have potential to revolutionize the field of photonics where the application will be typically in communication, sensing and optical computing. So, I will not go into much details of this, I will just give you an overview that these are the potential applications of 3D uh, nonlinear photonic crystals, okay. So, they can provide enhanced nonlinear effects, nonlinear dispersion engineering where by engineering the band structure of the photonic crystal, it will be possible to modify the dispersion relation of light enabling control over the phase matching conditions for nonlinear processes. You can also develop nonlinear optical devices, something like you know photonic crystal waveguides will be then used to guide and confine nonlinear optical signals following uh, allowing for uh, efficient energy transfer and enhanced nonlinear effects. The nonlinear effects can also be used for all optical switching. So, photonic crystal structures can be designed to exhibit large nonlinear responses, which allows for modulation and control of signal of light using other light signals. Okay, so that becomes all optical. You can also use them for quantum information processing. So, that is a, another very interesting area currently going on. So, photonic crystal waveguides and cavities can confine and guide photons, enabling efficient photon generation, manipulation, and detection which are crucial for quantum communication, quantum cryptography and also quantum computing, okay. So, this is I think you, we have already seen this in the topological photonic crystal kind of uh, discussion we had earlier. So, here it shows the routing photons with the topological photonic structure, okay. So, how it helps this topological photonic uh, crystals? It helps in integrated optics. So, topological photonic crystals can be used to design compact and efficient photonic devices such as waveguides, splitters and couplers for on-chip optical communication and computation. They allow robust light propagation because uh, they, they are basically lossless, okay, and they are prone, they are not prone, they are robust against any kind of manufacturing defects. Okay. So, you can safely use them for telecommunication, optical interconnect, quantum information processing and so on. You can use them for optical sensors. So, the unique properties of this topological photonic crystals can be leveraged by uh, using them in highly sensitive and robust optical sensing which are capable of detecting changes in the environment or analyte with high precision. Okay. Then you can also use them in nonlinear optics. So, the presence of topological edge states in these crystals can enhance the nonlinear optical effects, which enables the development of efficient all optical signal processing devices like frequency converters, okay, and also optical switches. You can use them in biophotonics, okay. So, you can use them for bi uh, biosensing drug delivery and therapy, cell imaging, analysis, photonic crystal fibers, okay. So, one just a, one important application, you can you can go through this table here and find out more details about it. So, photonic crystal fibers are those currently used in various biophotonics application including endoscopy, fluorescence imaging and light delivery of photodynamic therapy. So, this is something something very very useful. Okay. So, this is a schematic that shows uh, level free biosensing via photonic crystal. Okay. These are the applications in metamaterial and metasurface front. Okay. So, you can actually um, see the binding process of uh, biotin and streptavidin. These are basically some kind of uh, biomolecules. So, the liquid wall that is shown in red circle, it shows the receptacle uh, for liquid solution confinement. So, how does it help? Okay, this kind of, uh, th these are some applications where metamaterials are basically used in conjunction with photonic crystals, right. So, these are basically surface plus mount resonance based biosensor, 
which con consisted of sensitive biological elements like transducers or detective el detector elements that you can see. Okay. So, when biotin is introduced, the resonance frequency gets shifted and this shift in resonance frequency changes the capacitance. Uh, this, this basically shift comes from the change in capacitance of these uh, linkers okay? uh, because bonding of this biotin and uh, streptavidin basically changes the capacitance and that will reflect in the resonance frequency shift. You can also think of uh, other devices like optical switches, super lenses, cloaking devices, energy harvesting and solar cell. So, cloaking devices like um, you know by controlling the refractive index distribution in the photonic crystal combined with the unique properties of the matter materials, researchers can develop uh, designs for cloaking devices in various frequency ranges including the visible light. There are applications in nanophotonics as well. So, here is a diagram of an ultra broad broadband multimode interference coupler. Okay. So, it incorporates a central multimode region that is basically divided at a sub wavelength scale and it can manipulate the waveguides and isotropy and dispersion. Okay. So, you can also think of making other optical uh, communication devices, optical filters based on photonic crystals. So, photonic crystals, I will just uh, highlight on this application. Photonic crystals, we have seen this that uh, they have a lot of application towards making tunable optical filters. So, tunable optical filters are basically those devices that can selectively control the transmission or reflection of uh, specific wavelength of light and uh, they are particularly very important for optical communication or optical sensing application. These are some applications in integrated photonics. So, here a design of photonic crystal cavity for extreme light concentration is shown. Okay. So, you can have photonic crystal cavities and optical modulators. Okay. So, integrated photonic crystals, um, photonics facilitates the integration of uh, photonic crystal cavities with other optical components on the chip that enables the creation of highly uh, efficient and compact optical resonators and these cavities are used in applications such as lasers, filters and sensors. Okay? And uh, for optical modulators, integrated photonics can also be used to fabricate those modulators that can control the intensity, phase or polarization of light and if you incorporate some active materials such as electro-optic polymer or semiconductor materials within the photonic crystal structure, you can achieve efficient modulation. There are different smart materials, something like you can incorporate liquid crystals. Okay? So, by incorporating liquid crystals into the structure of photonic crystals, you can uh, change the refractive index of the crystal within the crystal uh, dynamically by applying some voltage and that will allow tuning of the band gap or the spectral response of the crystal. Right? So, liquid crystal based photonic crystals will find applications in tunable applications like, like filters, switches, displays and so on. You can also have uh, some electroactive polymers which are basically uh, materials that can change shape or volume in the response of some electrical stimuli. So, they also offer ability to actively deform or uh, modulate the structure of the photonic crystal. So, if you integrate this kind of electroactive materials into photonic crystal structure, the lattice parameter refractive index of the photonic band gap can be adjusted. Okay? And that allows you to again achieve tunable optical devices, something like deformable mirrors, waveguides, modulators, etc. You can also incorporate phase change materials into photonic crystals. So, there the crystal's optical property can be switched between different states that enables reconfigurable and programmable optical devices. What are the applications? You can think of optical memories, modulators, reconfigurable photonic circuits and so on. You can also think of some optically active materials, something like chiral molecules and nanostructures. They basically have the ability to selectively interact with uh, circular polarized light. So, the chirality depends the uh, decides the way it will interact with circular polarized light. Okay? You can use them for enantiomer separation in drug molecules and so on. So, by incorporating this kind of molecules into the structure of photonic crystal, the crystal's polarization properties or the chiro optical response 
can be manipulated or controlled. So, with that we will come to a conclusion of this lecture. So, if you have any query or doubt regarding this lecture, you can drop an email to this email address mentioning MOOC and the lecture number on the subject line. Thank you. Thank you.